first, um, what are we going to do today? Uh, we ended the Hamiltonian discussion uh, with an uh, algebraic approach. What I'd like to do before we go on to some more uh, and the most hairy algebra of our uh, class uh, is this, to look at a direct approach um, with, with, of this uh, trebuchet and uh, contrast it with the opposite trebuchet, the anti-trebuchet, uh, in discussing uh, the kinematics of uh, uh, human uh, sports, building a culture, all that kind of stuff. So. Um, that will occupy probably a quarter of the class because it's kind of interesting and we'll show some uh, simulations uh, that um, talk about uh, parametric amplification, which is a topic at the end of, of Unit 4, but we can get a feeling for how it plays a role in this nonlinear motion that the trebuchet is exhibiting. And then I'd finally like to do the formal development of the riemann christoffel equations, that's the, um, perhaps the most complicated way to, to say f equal ma. And uh, these are coefficients that are used in um, general relativity to describe the curvature of space and time, in differential geometry to just describe the curvature of surfaces or hypersurfaces. So we're going to do the tensor analysis a little bit further than we have uh, in Unit 1 when we introduced the uh, <coughs> generalized curvilinear coordinates and the covariant and the contravariant vectors. Um, I'll use an example once again of cylindrical polar coordinates. This time it will be three-dimensional, but it will be a review of what we did uh, there. And I've given you some problems that uh, involve uh, spherical coordinates, and I'm going to ask you to do the calculations uh, that uh, involve uh, these uh, weird coefficients, these non-tensors. We're going to make a big point about how they're, what's different between those things and, and tensors. So um, that's the order of the day here, and um, I'm going to uh, go very quickly through this. Uh, stuff that we've already done, making uh, Hamiltonians out of Lagrangians and uh, uh, then manipulating the Hamiltonians in such a way that I could solve a, in a closed form expression uh, the velocities of the uh, trebuchet under some rather easy conditions, namely no gravity. Uh, we'll kind of be doing something like that uh, today. So I would like to start right here uh, <clears throat> in the uh, thing that I showed you before, all of the ancient world stuff that we still do, but we don't have to because we can hire machines uh, to do uh, most of this work uh, pretty well. Uh, I don't see very many people throwing this thing. It actually is, uh, as I'm going to explain, uh, when we do a simpler model of that, uh, quite uh, quite challenging to get that uh, right. It's like the trebuchet; everything has to be uh, pretty uh, good, or it doesn't work. But that's kind of true of um, any sort of uh, motion like this, and in particular, if you're actually trying to hit uh, a, a rapidly moving tennis ball, or even one that isn't moving more than the fact that you've thrown it up to serve it. Uh, you can certainly appreciate that it takes a, a bit of skill to do that. And, um, well, we have one tennis player running the camera, another one is uh, actually quite accomplished. I don't know if you played tennis at all, but um, you're going to learn today how, how the theory works anyway. And um, then uh, I mentioned um, cultivating and digging. We still have to make gardens and a lot of, I know my wife does a lot of that. <coughs> we just finished the World Series and the pitchers were too good for our, our Kansas City Royals so the, the batters who were perfectly capable of driving a ball quite a few hundred yards uh, didn't get a chance to do it at the last minute so uh, we 
ended up the losers on that um, thing. The most exotic example of what we're talking about here is the uh, planetary slingshot. This kind of motion is uh, sort of like that. Or I showed in an earlier picture of this thing, the uh, water skier being pulled uh, around and made to go uh, very fast. So this sort of parametric amplification of, here I've got it right here, uh, water skiing uh, is uh, and another example of things that uh, get whipped uh, about. Now, fly fishing, that's uh, a good example of using uh, uh, a trebuchet-like motion with a long lever. So the question is, how can we model this? And how can we use it? And what, uh, how do you connect it? And what do you learn from um, watching the simulations? We've already seen a simulation, and we've noticed it in the very early part of this uh, throwing, the uh, velocity is very much changing. That is, the acceleration uh, is very high. The rate of energy going into the projectile is very high. And mainly it's because the force is large and the force is pretty much in the direction that the uh, object goes. Now, as the trebuchet evolves, uh, it finally comes to a point where um, it really can't um, add much more energy to it because the force uh, vector now is uh, um, very close to perpendicular to the velocity, so f dot v is a, a, a very small or zero or even negative if we go uh, further uh, on that trajectory without releasing the projectile. So um, the idea of uh, using this knowledge to improve your baseball, tennis, lacrosse, um, squash, all sorts of lever sport, um, excellent in golf, particularly because golf is totally a, a for the drive, an object of getting things uh, off to a uh, high velocity. The uh, trebuchet is telling us that you've got to get the energy in early if the motion that you're doing is like the trebuchet. So um, I bring one last uh, thing here, and this I would certainly uh, make a bigger fuss about it if this were an undergraduate class because we still have people that are young enough to go to the fair and try to ring the bell with a hammer. And uh, uh, that's all over the United States. I don't know if you find it in India or other countries. Uh, bell yeah. and a tower yeah. it's it's a hammer. and a hammer. Yeah. So uh, the question is, uh, how do you do that? I sort of by experiment uh, discovered when I was at Hiram College that um, all I had to do was make sure the hammer was way back here and I could do it with one hand, which is, you know, uh, it's more of a physics achievement. Um, and I learned to do that because I saw um, at the fair once a very husky, very strong um, man who was kind of, you know, was trying to push the <coughs> thing to the front. The ball went out only about that far and fell back down again. Then his girlfriend came up, bang! <laughs> so what's the difference? You see, there's a technique to that. And the uh, idea in all of this is get the energy in uh, early. Get the get the get the uh, lever moving uh, fairly rapidly, because then you don't have to. Um, if you've got everything sort of moving, uh, you can do more uh, in the line of, of making sure that the uh, aiming, making adjustments, and of course the idea is to do it in such a way you don't have to do very much adjustment. But the idea is to have sort of a follow through, a whipping motion of the tennis racket and the energy has to go in early, which means you have to turn, get back here, and then come forward uh, on tennis. And with golf, you have a club and you want to be uh, as far back as you can. And imagining you're pulling the sleeve off of the shaft. You want this force in the direction of velocity along the shaft to be uh, as high as possible in the beginning. So, uh, to uh, discuss that, I'm going to uh, compare these two, the 
uh, trebuchet-like uh, thing and a flinger-like uh, uh, throwing mechanism. Um, the trebuchet, and I'll go ahead and put the, that thing up on this screen just to uh, show you uh, what uh, is involved here. This is the, uh, go ahead and bring the camera over to this uh, part here. There, as you've already seen, it's a trebuchet. Now, with the same parameters, the same parameters roughly, as much as I can, for these two devices, um, I'm going to do uh, this one, this right here. So that was more or less the same uh, initial uh, parameters, and we'll discuss this more quantitatively uh, shortly here. But the basic idea is um, this device here, uh, which is a pole cue with a skateboard wheel uh, sliding um, on that. And skateboard wheels usually have a little bit of graphite in it. My sons are skateboarders, so um, we built this fairly quickly. And the idea is that th this one's really easy. You can't go wrong. Uh, You'll, you'll throw this thing a, a good distance with this thing, and um, it's quite easy, if, provided that the mass here is fairly light. Uh, you, you, the difference is that this is a last minute cram for energy, uh, and we'll, we'll quantify this in, in uh, just a minute here, but the idea is that uh, as we go out, it's, it, it, the acceleration is, great, is getting more and more. Uh, instead of not, not too much happening early on, and the closer this thing is to the uh, shaft, it may not be even enough to have anything happen, but you have to pick a place to have that thing start. And then uh, it's just at the last minute that it gets a, tr a tremendous amount of uh, energy. It's not what you want to do with a lever, not what you want to do with any of these uh, uh, lever sports or uh, going back in history, uh, the uh, chopping and rock breaking and all of that. That's not the way you want to do uh, the energy input. You want the energy uh, input for this thing to uh, be done early on because you're not going to be able to get it in uh, at the end. You see, this lever is against, the lever is against you, long lever against you. Um, the uh, trebuchet is uh, taking advantage of the lever. This is a lever that's actually uh, counting against you as far as uh, how much force can you apply uh, to that thing way out on the end there. How big can you get this to be? Because a trebuchet can get it very big and does so in the beginning. So this is the kind of an experiment that I've messed around with when we have time to uh, test things. And this is this, this is a hard thing to throw. This is easy. But this is hard. If you get this one right, you get a lot more. And we'll, we'll show that numerically and uh, algebraically uh, uh, here. But you can see uh, from the simulation that it's ra rather uh, quite a bit less uh, coming from that uh, device that uh, we uh, showed there. So, um, you know, it's it's um, a little bit unfair to have it just be away because you, you know with this thing you can really whip a pull cue uh, around but you can also whip this one even though you keep the green the I the same and the L the same. So we're going to compare these two uh, numerically uh, with a certain approximation uh, that uh, assumes just for the sake of making things really easy that this is on a rotating turntable of constant angular velocity, omega. So here's the um, trebuchet model. And um, what we're doing is we're going to calculate how much energy I get into that thing in the frame of the beam. So this is everything that's being done on this page. Uh, and, and the same thing is true uh, here. We're going to be actually standing on the uh, turntable and watching uh, things uh, move and calculating how much energy I gain 
is I slide out the uh, finger uh, um, tube. Okay, and then this is the more sophisticated uh, tre trebuchet uh, that also is going to be gaining energy precisely in the same way. Uh, we're going to assume that we can write our effective Hamiltonian uh, as a potential uh, that uh, uh, is quadratic but upside down. So this is the uh, potential associated with a uniformly ro rotating object and it's uh, just asking how much energy do I gain if I start here and let it slide out, gaining that much uh, um, uh, okay, final kinetic energy by losing that much potential. Okay? Potential just being the difference from where I start to where I finish. I'm going to equate that uh, to one half mv squared and see what the velocity is. So, without um, solving uh, any equations, actually this would be um, described in time by hyperbolic cosine, so it's essentially an exponential um, gain, uh, and that's true for this one too. The question is, how does this beat that? Okay, and uh, we'll uh, try to calculate that. So the idea here is that the uh, the trebuchet uh, energy, kinetic energy, one half. Now this is just in the beam frame. Then we'll add uh, whatever it, it uh, uh, whatever extra rotation I have. Uh, so we're working in a rotating frame here, and the rotating frame has given us this effective uh, upside down per parabolic potential that uh, will let us uh, calculate um, the difference between these. Now, basically what's going to happen, let's just look at this one here first. This one's going to be the uh, final uh, <coughs> value of this upside down parabola, okay, one half m omega squared, uh, rb plus l, so we're going to start here uh, at this point, and then we're going to slide out uh, to this point, that's going from rb to rb plus l, so the final is rb plus l squared minus, uh, the, you know, how much potential did I have uh, originally uh, when this thing was right there. Okay, so when you take this rb squared plus 2rbl plus l squared uh, and then subtract the rb squared, uh, then you'll get a, an rbl and then an l squared and I take the l outside. So that's the answer for that one. This one uh, right here is a little bit different. Um, if I'm going to be starting uh, with this thing, located, uh, say, at 6 o'clock, that's the uh, one, one that we'll do here, it's a 6, six o'clock initial position, okay, and we'll compare that with the 9 o'clock later on, which is really what you want to get back here and get a lot of drop right here, but we're just going to start right here, uh, and that means we're going to be starting right here with the uh, initial r squared plus l squared uh, distance, that is this distance right here, uh, the, rate, the square of this hypotenuse right here is just the sum of the squares of these two dimensions, R, B, and L, and so that's your initial, and then the final, I'll have reached all the way to the end and be at R, B plus L, okay? And so when you work that one out, you get one half M omega squared, 2 R, B uh, plus L. So on this, this is, this one's looking like um, the uh, Flinger wins. I only got RBL. Uh, this one's got RB plus 2L. Well, now the, the uh, thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the thing back here so that it's right uh, on the thing and then this one is going to game uh, on that one. In any case, um, that's the uh, 6 o'clock uh, final point. And you'll see that the Flinger kinetic energy here, uh, more than this one, is more than the 6 o'clock uh, 
a trebuchet, but it's misdirected, you see, because this one is, is ending up with the uh, projectile actually headed in the direction that the beam is rotating. So I can add whatever that velocity is, and remember we said it was constant omega, that's assuming this is massive enough, it's not going to slow down from this thing going out there, uh, appreciably. So um, we're just keeping it constant. Um, in that case, we're going to be able to add those velocities, whereas this one, I'm going to be adding the velocity transverse to this one. Okay? So that's, that's the, uh, the, the difference uh, that is uh, w worth looking at. Now, the flinger, um, let's see, this is initial 9 o'clock here. Um, the flinger KE is less than a 9 o'clock trebuchet. This is a 9 o'clock trebuchet. This is a 6 o'clock trebuchet. Uh, this, and this time, forget the, the just the plain uh, speed. Uh, of this is going to be less uh, than this one. Okay? So, put some numbers into this uh, thing. Now we're going to uh, add the, to get the velocity in the uh, lab frame. So we'll have the rotation here, RB plus L, that will be the velocity that we get to add to whatever we got uh, in the beam frame. And we can do the same thing here. Okay, we can add um, the beam frame to this thing that's been misdirected perpendicularly and get a speed that's uh, like that. And it's, I purposely drawn that one small compared to this one, but you can see the idea uh, behind this. So here, here uh, is the thing for uh, a case where we have RB, this thing equal to 2, and L just a, a little bit, okay? Here's where they're equal, and that was the uh, Siege of Kenilworth trebuchet. Uh, having those two very close to each other is uh, a good thing if you want to get uh, kinetic energy. You can see it's really working here. Uh, we're talking just here about uh, velocity, okay? We're getting six times the rotation speed of that. We were getting about three on the Siege of Kenilworth, but that no one was keeping the omega uh, constant there. And then this one over here, well, compare that to this one, okay? With that set up, this thing's only about four, and this one's getting six. So that's pretty impressive to get four times uh, the velocity that you uh, are rotating the uh, stick in the case of the pool keel thrower. So that and then, uh, yeah, but you'll see here with RB uh, equal to 1 and L equal to 2, okay, this is 1 and that's uh, twice as much. That's really what this picture here. Uh, we're getting a little less than 6, but it's pretty close. This one hasn't changed much. It's a little bit more, but uh, still quite a bit less than that. So that just gives you a feeling for uh, and remember, you square these velocities to get energy, but if you're just talking about velocity, it's quite impressive. Okay, so that's the end of that, although I would like to point out that there's things that could be done with this. If you're interested in, um, in you know, following up on this, and I've been meaning to do this for years and just haven't gotten around to doing it, but it's, it seems to me that we really have some three corners to uh, research in physics. It used to be there was only two, laboratory observation and theoretical analysis, but uh, we've got computers that we can play with and we can connect the computers up so that they actually look at the device itself and fit parameters to make the thing very accurate. So um, this is just going through what we're learning here in the course right now, the Lagrange equations, um, the Riemann crystal that we're going to learn about today, and the Anglo-Irish approach, of course, was what we did last lecture. Uh, for this kind of device uh, with Hamilton's equations. So um, I would say that it's worthwhile uh, thinking about now that cameras are fairly cheap and the uh, uh, interface with the computer is, is uh, you know, we're finding it's quite iffy, but I think we can improve on that and there are people who have done that. So um, all of this stuff that we've been talking about on the trebuchet 
than beyond the computer sim simulating. All right, um, I'm going to switch over uh, now um, to the uh, Riemann Christoffel. But before I do that, I'd like to show you a couple of other simulations. Let me um, go ahead and quickly get this thing set up here on uh, Lecture 20. And we'll uh, start that going. But remember, I was talking about getting energy in early and uh, having it um, behave. I'm going to try to do this simulation with a, um, the program that we call Jerk It, uh, which um, is uh, in the set of, of, uh, of drop back here just a little bit. Um, here's the, the uh, software that's available uh, on the um, internet right now. It includes the trebuchet down here, a lot of relativity, a lot of mechanical stuff, the pendulum, some molecular modes, and then this thing called jerk it. Um, the, the pendulum uh, and the cycloidulum uh, we've looked at already. We're going to be using uh, Kula, and actually I'm going to show you a little bit of Boxit again to, today. But this jerkit is really uh, something we're going to talk about in detail in Unit 4, but I thought you ought to see it just to get used to an idea of parametric amplification. Now what this is, is simply an um, upside down pendulum, which is getting ready to fall. And when it does, you can see that every once in a while it accelerates a lot. I can just uh, start it off uh, here. And you can see every once in a while it just, just gets the timing right, right there. Okay? That's an example of an exponential growth of, uh, of um, oscillator energy. Whenever it's doing that, very unstable and very explosive. Um, if I set the parameters to this uh, slightly differently, and I'm going to erase the paths uh, before I, I share this one. This is quite a, uh, an interesting one. These paths. Okay, it started off uh, fairly low here. Let's see if that's right. But what this is a model of is a um, Schrodinger equation with a periodic potential. The Schrodinger equation is being written with the independent variable x replaced by time. So um, there's an oscillation going on here. I should be able to control a little better than was. I've got, but um, the oscillation right here is being kept constant. This this uh, motion, um, slow it down a little bit here, is harmonic. So the equation uh, for uh, this is the same as the non uh, relativistic uh, Schrodinger equation. Okay, and it's, uh, the idea is that the um, acceleration with x replaced by time. So we're plotting time out there, but think of it as x if you want to follow the shapes of things, uh, is equal to some constant, okay, plus or minus a function of x, which in this case is cosine of x, but if x is replaced by time, multiplying the uh, in the dependent variable, the oscillation um, amplitude. And uh, the idea is that the um, acceleration, that is the uh, reason they call it parametric application, is because this is the spring constant right here, if it were constant, of an oscillator. A harmonic oscillator, if it were um, just a constant, okay? You have a double derivative of this equal to a constant times the spring constant determines the frequency. 
So what we've got something whose frequency is being modulated. You might call it FM amplification. But it's parametric amplification. This parameter here is being uh, given a cosine or sine soidal uh, motion. So this is a very um, uh, unstable, when you think of it in time, uh, device. But you can see that uh, if you get the parameters just right, it's very well behaved. People that ride unicycles learn to find the parameter space that is the stable bands and, and uh, the frequency versus uh, the um, amplitude of the uh, force, which uh, will allow them to remain upright on something that's only being supported at one point, like a unicycle. So th this is the uh, you know very interesting system uh, that requires a really a different kind of uh, mathematics to treat it. And also, the mathematics that we use makes it possible for you to go over and do um, some Schrodinger equations uh, more efficiently. So that's something that's coming up uh, in Unit 4. Now, um, this, this particular um, case here, I was just hoping I could uh, reset this thing uh, completely. And uh, to try to get it to go again. It, I was hoping I could get rid of the initial conditions here. Uh, I will uh, just start with this one and see if that uh, is the uh, ticket to this. There we go. That's uh, raised to pads there. What you're seeing here is a wave function inside a potential. And of course, when it gets that far, it isn't, isn't doing that anymore. I'll try to bring it back here. Let's see if I can get this. There we go. So it goes inside the potential and oscillates and then goes into a, well, it's, it's a as soon as it gets to a large amplitude, it isn't showing your equation anymore. It's called the sine Gordon equation at that point. But um, the uh, funny thing is that this band edge is very stable, which is quite, quite, uh, quite neat. And you're getting a wave function that stays, uh, you know, more or less like it would in a quantum mechanical uh, solution. Although this one uh, has a fairly um, wide amplitude, the uh, third one here is kind of interesting too. Anyway, we'll analyze these things in upside down uh, motion. Uh, here, the interesting thing is to find the gaps where it, it will explode from this point and trebuchet. So uh, we have a, a little heads up on this uh, system that uh, I think you'll find enjoyable. And it's related to trebuchet uh, type motion of uh, that whipping uh, action that uh, amplifies things a lot. Okay, now we're going to come back to uh, down to earth, so to speak, uh, to our uh, algebra and finish the third, the shall we say, Teutonic or German approach uh, to uh, mechanics, uh, where uh, we have uh, really adopted the tensorial. Uh, mathematics. Now, the one question I want to answer today is what's a tensor and what's not? And I also want to give you a formula for the Christoffel question and then show you a much easier way uh, to derive and use them and what are they. They're basically coefficients that give you Coriolis and centrifugal forces in a curvilinear coordinate system. So uh, that um, will be the main uh, topic of this. And also a thing called the covariant derivative uh, uses these coefficients. So it's a, a, a way to make a derivative that uh, accounts for the curvature of the space you're in. So this is why it got used for general relativity by Einstein uh, many years after Riemann had uh, developed it. 
So let's just go ahead again. We've seen this notation uh, for a vector written as a linear combination of, uh, in this case, a covariant vector, covariant unitary vectors, covariant GCC vectors, uh, which have to have um, the contravariant uh, components. Uh, and remember, when we do that, we make these things that we're writing in bold notation with no indices. Uh, these are invariant. This is some physical object. And uh, all of these uh, different types of queer coordinates, generalized curvilinear linear coordinates, are just different ways of looking at the same thing. So that's what we mean by invariant. We're, we're talking about an actual physical object. It's going to be the same physical object regardless of what queer coordinates we use, what viewpoint we take of that uh, object. Uh, this is very much in a relativistic uh, a sort of way of thinking about things. In relativity, you have uh, different uh, coordinates of space and time, but you're always looking at the same event, some sort of thing that happened at a particular point at a particular time. But the numerical values of those uh, coordinates uh, vary tremendously uh, depending on what uh, speed, uh, what velocity frame you're in. So uh, we're just imagining generalizing that to both velocity and acceleration and general relativity. And then we have uh, these things written in boldface to indicate something that uh, is physically immutable, only being looked at from different frames. In any case, uh, we get two terms, once again. Uh, partial derivative of the uh, components of the uh, whatever uh, this vector u is. And that would be the end of it if these e's would just not move, not change direction or length, but they do, and therefore we need uh, to have that. The second term is non-zero for curving uh, vectors. They will change as you change your position uh, uh, in the uh, space uh, in question. So um, what we're going to do is define this really deserves a triple equal sign here in the identity. The derivative of a GCC quasi-unit vector is expressed, well, you can express it in terms of contravariant, or else you can express it in terms of its kind, which is covariant. Uh, this would be expressing it in terms of contravariant. And when you do that, you indicate uh, this coefficient by uh, index that matches by being down to the uh, contravariant that is uh, the linear combination that results from taking that derivative. So that's called the uh, Christoffel coefficient of the first kind, namely uh, this coefficient right here is the dot of this expression with E sub L. So if I dot both sides of this equation in E sub L, this disappears. E dot L sits over here like that. And that's the definition of this uh, thing. Now, uh, it turns out that um, this coefficient and this coefficient are equal. That is, it doesn't make any difference whether I take the partial derivative of E n with respect to Q i or the partial derivative of E i with respect to Q n. That's simply because E is already made of uh, partial derivative uh, with respect of the position vector or something with respect to uh, q. Okay? Same thing is true for Christoffel coefficients of the second kind, where you're writing uh, this derivative using covariant vectors. In that case, you use the second kind coefficient with a um, contra uh, knife in the air uh, parameter in this sum. Uh, that gives uh, the linear combination of covariant vectors that this derivative is uh, uh, making. Okay, so those are the definitions of these things. They're pretty simple. But you see, it's the same problem we had when we started GCC in general. We got a generalized velocity very easily, a Jacobian for that was the same as a Jacobian for the differentials. But when we went through acceleration, we needed extra terms, right? And that's what gave you the Lagrange equations. Well, here we're trying to do the geometry of that. So um, I point out 
uh, here that when you take a derivative of r, that's the partial derivative of n with respect to i, uh, you, you take a uh, double derivative, it turns into a double derivative, and that is supposed to be interchangeable. And therefore, uh, you get this result here. I should be able to do those in e either order. So that's why I say these are symmetric, and so are these. Okay? The symmetry ends there, though. Okay. Now, you could ask, do I need a third kind of coefficient? They say a, a, a lambda coefficient instead of a gamma coefficient. Uh, if I want to uh, do a, a derivative of a contravariant vector, or if I work with those things, uh, like you do in Lagrange, this uh, world. Okay? Do I have to have a whole nother set of these bloody things? Uh, defined in the same way, except that it's a contravariant vector now that's being differentiated. And uh, the problem is looking uh, like it's going to be a mess, but it's not. The answer to this question is no. A lambda coefficient is just a gamma coefficient with a minus sign. The way you see that is to say that you will get a zero if you take the partial derivative with respect to q of the delta function, that is the e n dot e m, whereupon you see that you're, you're going to get a zero if you take first derivative of the contravariant dot the covariant, then you have to take the, the contravariant dot the derivative of the covariant. That's got to add up to zero. Therefore, the coefficient defined by that is just minus what we've already defined up here. And this will work uh, for either of the uh, ways of expanding covariant or contravariant. Okay? So the idea is that the vector derivative, this partial with respect to q of the invariant vector that we're interested in exploring, uh, is going to be just the usual partial and then this is the correction that accounts uh, for the curve of the uh, curve uh, coordinate system, assuming uh, that you can find these derivatives and the ones that are going to be uh, making up this thing. Okay? Or you can write it with a minus sign and uh, use contravariant vectors as your expansion. Okay? So, that's the, the deal uh, as far as the uh, lambda coefficients. Uh, you don't need to find a new notation for that. Now, you, you should notice that whenever we um, write these things, we put this funny little semicolon uh, there. That's to distinguish it from uh, 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 just a plain comma. If you put a comma there, you, you mean that thing in most, uh, in most uh, uh, literature that I've seen. So the, the, the semicolon uh, says, hey, you got to be a little, a little more careful here with your curves. So we've got um, something we're going to call the covariant derivative, that is a coefficient uh, that represents that whole thing there, you see, is going to replace the notation that I normally would write if all I had to do is put that thing. That would be um comma i in Jackson's book, for example. But um colon semicolon i has got this extra uh, term on it. It's not just the partial derivative with respect to qi, and it works uh, as all as it also uh, if you're going to be t uh, talking about contravariant. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, in this case covariant component that goes with a contravariant vector, this is the, the contravariant component that goes with the covariant vector, doesn't have a minus sign, it's a plus sign. Okay. Well, it's getting a little thick here, but this is um, the basis. This is where you start in any sort of differential geometry or, uh, or mechanics of GCC or else relativistic mechanics. So. Um, this is a case of mathematicians being cute. Um, I'm a little leery of this, but it's, you know, it's nice because 
you can write the equations of motion that we're about to get, the Riemann crystal symbol, simply as F equal this delta derivative of momentum. And if it's covariant F, then it's covariant momentum. If it's contravariant, then it's contravariant. That's a velocity. Remember, P, K uh, turns out to be U, the actual coordinate, contravariant coordinate. Okay? But the idea is that you define this thing as the usual derivative, and then you put the Christoffel coefficients here times the velocity. Okay? So that uh, lets you um, see if there's uh, anything I can say. Yeah, when you do this total derivative here, that's your usual chain expansion, right? Now we've got to add this because we're in curve coordinates to make this thing. This is a new kind of derivatives. As I say, mathematics is being cute. Okay? So what you do is you go ahead and you say it's VK semicolon N Q dot. And VK semicolon is just a partial derivative of the VK with respect to QN plus that. Now, if it's covariant things you're working with, it's minus that. Okay, this is v uh, k semicolon n q dot n covariant instead of contravariant that we have here. Either one of these uh, is a fair game as the notation goes, but all you're doing is saving a little bit of pencil head or pen ink uh, most of the time chain rules that we're talking about uh, get, you know, get this uh, extra term uh, added either plus or minus. Now, let's get a formula uh, for the Christoffel coefficient, the usual formula that you'll find in almost all the books that uh, use these things. Uh, that's mostly relativistic literature, but any differential geometry uh, book will do it too. Uh, what you've got here is a partial derivative with respect to QI of our metric coefficient, our covariant metric. I'm doing the covariant metric uh, first here. That's all we need, as it turns out. We can use that metric coefficient to raise any indices that we uh, need to, if we need to go contravariant. But this is a uh, IM semicolon N coefficient, and this is just the flip of that. N and M have flipped, and that, those are not equal. I can't put a 2 on that, uh, uh, unless you have some very special accordance. However, I can go through and I can be switching uh, the I's and uh, N's and M's around and rewriting uh, these things. Here I switched I with N, here I switched I with M. That was the original expression. Okay. And it probably would help by realizing now that some of these uh, fonts and characters are pretty small, so we probably have to zero in on some of these in order to get them uh, all uh, showing up. Anyway, I've done this so that I put a minus sign on these, this particular one, I can uh, cross out uh, all but two. So that's the trick uh, to get an expression for a uh, Christoffel coefficient in terms of uh, th three derivatives of the metric uh, tensor. This was considered a you know, big deal by Riemann, and certainly it represents a uh, way that you can understand uh, what it is that you're getting with this coefficient. You're getting a very peculiar combination of metric derivatives. And that is the Christoffel uh, of um, a mathematician named Christoffel is responsible apparently uh, for that. Now, uh, remember chain saw sums transform a bar frame view to uh, uh, one that's not uh, that frame, going back to the original frame, so I can get uh, coefficients like this uh, simply by 
doing a transformation with Jacobians. Okay? And if that's, that's so, then this, this thing is a tensor expression. This uh, uh, definition of a mixed contra covariant uh, tensor of some kind. Um, here uh, it is uh, being written just again, uh, but then I pull these two guys apart, okay, and stick in a sum over the coordinate system that I want to go back to, okay. So then I get a Jacobian here, and then I have a partial derivative of mu q n dot that thing, okay, right there, and that turns into when these two guys get back together again, you have these two guys here, that turns into a covariant, contravariant transformation of the mixed tensor. That is, this gives me the barred coefficients in terms of the original uh, ones. It's a, a sum over n, and then a sum over m, and then it's giving me the m bar com component uh, and the n bar uh, component. Okay? So, the fact that we can write um, these combinations that way is uh, indicating that that's, that's what we mean by a tensor. There's a mixed uh, thing. Now, the transformation of coordinates, okay, and that have to be coordinates like that, is that of the general thing. In other words, these, uh, whatever, whatever it is that we're uh, talking about that's been appropriately written in GCC coordinates, I should be able to do that transformation and not worry about uh, it. So the question is, well, would a partial derivative of UM with respect to QN straight away uh, satisfy that? And the answer is a transformation of that thing is, as we can tell, not that simple because I've got to take derivative of that thing. Okay. You see, at first it looks possible. I do the chain sum separation here and stick in some uh, QNs. Okay, it looks like I've, I'm finished, except I'm not quite finished. Because you see, this thing's got a bar upstairs, but it's got something original downstairs, and I'm trying to get uh, this thing entirely in terms of things that aren't barred. So I still have work to do. Okay, still need to write this thing in terms of that. Okay, well that's where you get in trouble because now you do change uh, that thing to this thing, okay, by doing that. But I'm still, I've still, i got a derivative of that, which is going to be two terms. Uh, if the Jacobian is not constant, I'm going to have a derivative of the Jacobian, okay? So, if I didn't have that derivative, I'd be okay. This would be a transformation of that derivative from the barred tensor form to the unbarred ones, back in the old coordinate system, you see, doing that. No, I've got that thing. So that means first term okay, second term only zero, Jacobian's constant. Everywhere it's constant, I can do this. So you're just doing Lorentz transformations that are constant? Yeah, okay, you can get away with that. But if you're not, it's any sort of curve anywhere in your uh, geometry or else because you've got some stuff, uh, forces on the thing that make a different coordinate system needed. Uh, this holds only if Jacobian's constant. Okay? Now that means, that means um, that the uh, Christoffel symbols themselves are not tensors because they're correcting something and obviously they have to have a term in there that isn't, that isn't kosher in order to cancel the non-kosher term in the original uh, thing that you were trying to do. So that's um, just a little bit of an introduction to what we mean by a transformational symmetry. All right, well, let's go ahead and do an example. Our, our friendly polar coordinates example is what we'll use. It will be a three-dimensional one uh, with the z-axis on it as well. In any case, here's um, or metric, okay, and it will always be written um, as in terms of some constants in Cartesian coordinates, 
uh, and then derivatives to take us from the Cartesian coordinates to some curvilinear coordinate. So this is con converting a Cartesian kinetic energy, and I do see a typo there. That should be x, uh, meaning Cartesian. Uh, but anyway, the, the, this one right here is what we uh, want to end up with. Now, I mentioned already that this is this job that we're going to do here uh, with these Q dots had better just involve Cartesian Jacobian to cur uh, curvilinear and none of this, no explicit time dependence uh, is allowed in order to pull this Riemann job off. All right? And I said, how do they get around that? Well, they get around that very, very elegantly. Time must be included as one of the exits. Okay? So you have to make a time a dimension uh, in order to uh, include time. Uh, we'll not be doing that uh, here. Uh, but um, remember that we are now restricted uh, to consider things with no explicit time dependence in the energy uh, driver. So, here's our good old Lagrange equation that works for everything. And here's the kinetic energy going in with the metric. Okay? One half mv squared, basically. But it's a weird kind of m and a weird bunch of coordinates. Okay? And the main thing that's true here that isn't true here is that these can be any function of the coordinates. Not velocities, that would make a third rank thing, and that's a mess. So we're staying away from that. But here, I, I do want those guys to be constant. I don't want them as functions of x or uh, that typographical q there. Uh, I definitely want those to be constants. But these are not. These got lots of curves in. So the first uh, term here, this thing, involves the covariant momentum. We've already talked about uh, our momentum is defined as the kinetic energy with respect to Q dot. We've already worked this out once. So there's your uh, conversion from velocity, which is contravariant. The metric brings down the index, so you have a covariant quantity. Here. And I think we've said this enough times this year. I'm not surprised by that one. So um, I'll go on here. We will then invert that relation. Okay. There has to be an inverse to the metric at every point. And uh, here we will multiply the covariant thing and bring the index back up again. So Q dot M is identical to contravariant momentum. That's what velocity is. So in the, um, the uh, Poincaré, Legendre uh, invariant, uh, you have PQ dot. That's simply a product of P covariant with P contravariant sum. Okay, that's another way to see the invariance. Okay, now canonical Lagrange equations are supposedly uh, valid for any GCC. Uh, fixed or explicit in time, um, this 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 equation of motion will take that, okay, and as long as you uh, uh, obey what it says, uh, it will uh, do you. It will give you correct answers. But uh, the following that we're doing from now on, remind once again with red letters that uh, fixed GCC uh, only in what follows. Don't change the rules in the middle of the motion. So the time derivative of this uh, guy right here uh, is going to be expanded uh, the usual uh, way. That function uh, will be written in terms of Q dots. So that's going to give us a quadratic form. Uh, we already have one uh, here. It's just that we've got this extra thing uh, coming up. So uh, we get the uh, ln uh, that comes out of this thing uh, minus <coughs> one half of the gamma m n. And uh, 
So you have two, two quadratic uh, t terms there. Well, it, it's fortunate that you can go ahead and write this thing as a, uh, as a Christoffel symbol, okay? So I'm rearranging the definition that we gave before, just replacing L's uh, with the N, or the N with the L, and so forth. And remember that these are symmetric, these, these metric coefficients. Um, you, know, uh, you end up with something like that, and that's it. That is the covariant Riemann equations, the ones that you uh, see on the wall uh, over there at the bottom of the pile, uh, sort of the end of the road for uh, fancy ways to write ethical limit. This has certainly got to be uh, one of the fanciest. And uh, there is a covariant Riemann equation that we've just gotten, but we know how to get things contravariant. I just come through with one of the gammas that will cancel this gamma. I don't like what we did with the Rogers equation to get them into Riemann form. I will then get a co contravariant force uh, equal to a Q dot dot, and that's the uh, one that's at the bottom of the sheet over there that has the F with the index up like a contra. Uh, and it involves it's just the double dot time derivative of the contravariant coordinate mu. And I'll go ahead and put it on the board here. This is uh, written here. This is a contravariant equation. So this one uses the uh, Christoffel symbols of the first kind, and this one uses a, the second kind as an uh, odd index uh, up. And you don't need a semicolon uh, uh, on that one. Uh, so maybe that is a good thing to recommend. Now we're going to see a very different character between these two uh, in our example, uh, namely the cylindrical polar example. So um, this is pretty much what we've already done. If you just forget about the z, uh, we're taking a cylindrical radius, usually designated not by r but by rho. I don't like to do that anymore because I so much like to let rho be rapidity. But uh, we're not going that way today anyway, so we'll use conventional uh, ways of writing these things. So we'll have a, any force vector written uh, covariantly this way or in Cartesian notation uh, that way. And the uh, transformations Jacobian and Kajobian are for the 2x2 two two matrix exactly what we've already seen in uh, chapter 12 when we did polar coordinates, because that's all cylindrical coordinates are. Uh, and you just tack on a, a Cartesian z perpendicular to the polar plane. So here is a covariant set of vectors right there in the columns. And then there's a contravariant set of vectors uh, in these rows. So there's your bras, and there are your kets, if you want to use the quantum mechanical nomenclature. <clears throat> Covariant forces will have transformations just like this, using Jacobians. That's basically uh, lemma one that we've uh, talked about at least three times now. And um, here we have just simply, it looks kind of like a rotation, but it's got a radius rho uh, on the F partial x with respect to phi uh, here. It's got the minus rho and plus rho. <coughs> so that's what I get uh, there. Z is really not adding anything but zeros in the component that you'd have for just staying in the Cartesian realm. So contra covariant forces and covariant kinetic metric the dot of this, we're talking about one particle again in cylindrical coordinates, uh, requires uh, those dot products of the uh, covariant metrics, a dot, uh, this thing with itself and this thing with itself. This is an orthogonal coordinate system, so there won't be any off-diagonal uh, components of this particular example. And so it's very simple. There's a moment of inertia uh, for the phi phi um, contribution. Um, 
And then, and since it's diagonal, I could invert this thing very easily by simply making one over uh, each of, of these. Uh, and these are particularly small writing here, so uh, I don't even know if the camera can pick it up. Is it picking it up very well? Okay. So here's our Lagrangian we looked at before when we were just doing polar coordinates. Uh, we got that guy along for the ride uh, this time. Okay, now covariant momentum. All right. That's just what you'd expect. Uh, Cartesian coordinates, but this one gives you the inertia. You may remember we made a little bit of a fuss about that when we first uh, introduced uh, metrics. We were doing G phi phi and G rho rho uh, before. Now, uh, if I go through and raise the indices, there's your contravariant momentum. There is the velocities. Now we're going to compare the Lagrange and the Riemann uh, covariant force equations. And this is what's really cool. Instead of having to go through and look at, say we're in three dimensions like we are, I would have uh, 3 times 3 times 3 is 27 of these buggers, right? And so I would go and I'd use that horrible triple thing where I'd take three derivatives of the metric, uh, um, you know, the, the gamma uh, rho rho, phi phi, and zz, I'd take these three uh, things. Now, fortunately, I wouldn't have very many terms in, term, in the sense this, that these are going to have to be equal, but still, it's a real pain uh, to get these coefficients that way. Most of the time, you're getting zero. Well, what this will do, is give you these coefficients and only the coefficients are non-zero automatically. So that's what we're going to uh, do. And I want to make really note that this is a much more efficient way to derive the gamma coefficients. Either first kind or second kind, uh, you get them essentially immediately. <clears throat> now, in this particular case, there are only three non-zero crystal coefficients. I've got 27, 24 of them. Time. That's good. Makes things simple. Okay. This is what you want to know right away when you're doing equations and proving your components. So here was what you do. You just take each component, do its time derivative. This one only has one term, but be careful. That one's the one that you have to watch out for everything that moves. And then you've got to do a partial derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to the coordinate question, which is the radial one. Okay. That's all you have to do for this one. And you will be getting this one. So I use this to get that. And that's very efficient. As you can see, there's only one Christoffel coefficient that's not zero. Minus m rho. Okay. And that's a, a, a diagonal Christoffel coefficient, the phi phi. Uh, one uh, shows up. And of course we know what that is. That's your uh, mr omega squared. The centrifug centripetal or centrifugal uh, force depending on what it is actually. Centripetal at minus sign. Okay? So um, here's another one. This is the rho component. This is the phi component. The z is trivial so we, all the crystals are zero for that one. But uh, Here's what you do is you take this thing right here. Now, it happens kinetic energy has no feet of it, so I don't get anything there, but I do have to take a derivative of this, and that's two terms. Okay? You've already done that, right? Well, now you know what the Christoffel coefficients are. This one, for example, rho phi phi, they have to be equal. And that means, since you're summing over all these things in this equation, you're summing over m and n, both, you get an extra two here for the off diagonal ones. And then there's the kinetic term that we already have. Okay? That's just the gamma phi phi that uh, has uh, that form right there, m rho squared. Okay? So 
Um, there are the three Christoffel coefficients for this one. And there are no more. Now I'm going to give you the, on the problems you have been asked you to go ahead and do spherical coordinates. Oh, like, okay. So, can I to calculate the Christoffel symbol? Right. For yeah. Good, good exercise. It shouldn't take you very long. Um, so, there are your contravariant uh, equations of motion right uh, uh, here. Now, remember, contravariant makes uh, momentum into velocities. And so this turns out to be in a bunch of equations of acceleration. Okay? What I'm seeing here is rho dot dot minus rho v dot squared. Mass disappears. This is the way you get the mass out of, out of your equations. And just get things in terms of accelerations and velocities. So this is the uh, Coriolis uh, coefficient. Now this is a second kind Coriolis coefficients now, right? Same deal. Just do this, look at this, and see how they uh, come out. Put them in their uh, proper place. So this one is dealing with centrifugal acceleration. Okay. This is where our rho dot dot would normally be positive. Rho is always positive, and phi dot is squared has to be positive. So that's definitely centrifugal. And then this is the Coriolis. We've already looked at that, and we'll do it one more time here. This should uh, um, take us to the pretty much the end of what we need to do today. So once again, this is from lecture. 11, but now using these contravariant expressions, angular acceleration, how does the phi dot dot, you know phi dot would be a uniform rotation, this is a non-uniform rotation, one which will either speed up or slow down, depending on what the values of r dot and phi dot are. Now, because the Earth rotation is clockwise, just think here's the earth and you're on the side and you go around and there's the sun coming up, right? So right-handed uh, for northern hemisphere people, right? Even in India, right? You're still doing this, right? You have to go to Australia or a little bit further south uh, to have to be doing this uh, and change the signs of a few things here. But in the north, that's what we've got. We've got a phi dot greater than zero. And with a low pressure area that we talked about before, Dr. Hatter, I didn't get negative r dot. I could not understand this point when you say Earth rotation is clockwise in north. Because Earth is... Imagine the Earth. Uh, You're looking down on the Earth, right? Right. Okay. Arkansas is up here, right. you know, with 33 degrees or so mm -hmm. above the equator. 36, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you're, you're here, and the sun is going to come up, right? Right. The sun was over there, right? So nighttime to daytime, right? Right, right, right? So that's what the Earth is doing. Uh -huh. That's your phi dot relative stars. So if you're in southern hemisphere, wouldn't that still be the same? Like because the rotation would still be clockwise. Right? If you're in the southern hemisphere. If you're on Polaris looking at the Earth, it's counterclockwise. Oh, you're right. You're right. It's this is right. This is not <laughs> typo. I put this in late at night uh, to clarify, and I've obviously um, unclarified it. No, positive is right-handed, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, which is counter. Yeah, thumb up. That's right. Another, another typo. We've got to fix fix that. Okay, so. That's positive. It's a low pressure area, so R dot, okay, negative. It's coming in, right? So we've got a, a flow that starts out toward the low center. Very idealized low, most of them are, you know, messy. But uh, th this is a nice uh, one that would make a, a spot on Jupiter or something like that. So basically, what it's saying is inward flow to pressure low. R dot less than zero makes this thing right here. That's negative. 
that's positive. So this whole thing is positive. I get a negative and a negative in the R dot. So that makes it veer to the right. Positive rotation in, in, in uh, our, our coordinate system. Now one of the ways you can uh, hand wave this thing, I mean this is just giving you the whole thing all the way around, but you can say, okay, uh, if I'm coming in, um, you know, here, okay, I'm coming from a part of the earth that's spinning faster this way than where I'm going. Okay, so I've got extra velocity from earth being faster here and I go into a region with less velocity, I veer this way. Or coming from the North Pole where it's hardly rotating at all, and I'm moving this thing, I'm moving into a region where the Earth is moving this way, I'm going to be left behind, so I curve this way. Then you have, what's going on here? Okay? Well, what you do is you say, okay, here I'm adding to the centrifugal force by adding to the Earth's rotation around the turntable here, and that gives me a little extra centrifugal force that pulls me this way. Right? Whereas these guys are coming back, they take away some of that centrifugal force that was pulling them because of the Earth's rotation, and hence they go this way. So it really is a circle. It's, it's got circular symmetry. And this, of course, settles it, but that's a, a kind of a neat way to see how cyclonic flow really uh, uh, happens. Still, it's hard to think about. And so you have to have some um, sort of quick way to say, where will a gyroscope go when you do something to it? Uh, that's really what uh, the Earth is kind of gyroscope. Now we're, we've got stuff moving on it. Where is the Coriolis going to go? What this is trying to do is get its rotation in line and reduce the relative velocity of this with respect to the Earth. It's a rather poor way to do it because it's all concentrating and going really fast, uh, making a, a terrible hurricane or maybe even a tornado uh, uh, that uh, very often the tornadoes too have this rotation, the big ones. The really big ones are always that way in the northern hemisphere. It's only the little ones that can you know, come up sometimes with the, the positive energy state. This is a lower energy. Relative energy. We've got to think of waves. These waves interacting with the waves of the Earth have less beats. And the beats what counts. So we'll, we'll bring that concept up uh, later on when we talk about the gyroscope of that little device there. But uh, uh, this, this is just what's going on in Jupiter. Up in the northern hemisphere of Jupiter, we've got a red eye Jupiter turning this way, then this thing's turning this way. Jupiter's turning this way, then it's going to turn that way. So that's a you know sort of an easy, quick way to understand uh, uh, the vortices that form because you rotate a, 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 an object that can uh, a fluid flow uh, do weird things. And we're going to have a talk this uh, week on Friday uh, from a guy from Maryland, and he is going to. Uh, show us a little bit about uh, liquid helium vortices. Okay. So, uh, same thing. You turn the liquid helium a little bit, and all of a sudden, all these tornadoes form. But they're quantum tornadoes, which really makes it uh, you know, kind of interesting. Okay, I think that's it. We are uh, at a point where I think we should stop, because of timing. But I was going to do a little bit of effective We've already done that, so we'll, we'll, we'll catch that up.